So the plant I'd like to show you right now is amongst all these pond side plants. This is the pond that the house where I live in. And in this area, I've tried to clear away some of the non-natives to get some of the natives, uh, planted some of the natives to come in. And so it looks first like a big green tangle. But as you look close, uh, closer, of course, uh, when you know your different plants, you can see the distinctions. And so it's this plant right here that I'm going to talk about. And this plant is Calamus. Uh, so the genus is Achorus, and the species is Calamus. And it's in the family, the Achoraceae. It used to be in the same family as things like Jack in the Pulpit and Skunk Cabbage, the Araceae. But now it's in its own family. And actually, it's considered one of the first of the monocots. So first of the, mon first of the monocotyledons. And I have liked this plant for a very long time. <clears throat> And I'm really glad that it's doing well where I've planted it, so I just have it. I actually gather it in places where it's much, much thicker. There are some areas where you can find hundreds and hundreds of plants. Uh, but I like having it here as well. Uh, this is likely, so there's a lot of debate. So this is Calamus, uh, Acorus Calamus of the Acoraceae. And there's some questions about two different species that possibly grow in the United States. There's Acorus calamus, which would be considered a non-native, and then Acorus americanus, which would be considered a native. And the distinctions have to do with the veins in the leaves. Um, but also the distinction might have to do with one of them setting seed. So I'm not sure which one this is. I mean, typically it would be called Acorus calamus due to the way the venations, the ve venations means veins, veins in these very long leaves here. Um, but they're both used and for now, there's some tricky stuff about chemistry, but for now, I want to say that this is the species that I use uh, mainly. The other name for calamus is sweet flag, and it's definitely called sweet flag. It's not one of those weird names that nobody ever uses. Um, and sweet flag is confused with a plant that grows right next to it here, which is iris. So there's irises. This iris is not that, but there's an iris called blue flag. And blue flag iris does look like it. I'm going to show you some leaves of a yellow iris right now next to it. So this is, a, this in, in my left hand, this hand right here, this is calamus, a coarse calamus, and this is one of the iris species. And they both have veins running through the middle, but the coloration is different, and this is more succulent. But I want to say that while you may or may not see the difference is easy, the venation is the easiest thing and the flatter bit for the a coarse calamus. But here's the kicker, is if you break a little tip off and you smell it, calamus, has, unless you don't have any smell, uh, calamus has a very strong aroma, where the iris has a very weak aroma, and not at all like calamus. The next plant that it, it also looks like is cattail. I pulled one out nearby. These are also native plants. This is Typha latifolia. By the way, all of the plants I'm showing you are monocots. So they're evolutionarily, you know, way back when they do share evolutionary ancestors, but it's been a long time. The flowers are extraordinarily different from all of them. So this is cattail, and the cattail is very easy to tell apart because cattail, besides the coloration, does not have the mid vein, the rib going through it. Whereas, our, excuse me, calamus does. Iris does have a mid vein, but it's a more succulent plant, and the mid vein does look a little different. But again, pop off a little top, give a smell. Beautiful. That smell is so beautiful, aromatic. Aromatic. I'm not sure what, uh, what tongue I'm moving into, what accent. They all seem to just merge into some weird Brooklyn accent from my youth. So, but I actually have a Long Island accent, just to point that out. So, this is calamus and the part used is the rhizome and so I've, the rhizome are the underground structures of plants that have a couple of purposes so roots of plants anchor the plant and pull up moisture I'm not sure what this action is but the roots of plants anchor plants and pull up moisture and nutrients the rhizomes of plants often hold material for the plant so that when it dies back at the end of the year, it lives underneath the soil through the winter. So the rhizomes are very different medicinally or chemically often than the tops of plants. 
But the other thing that is important about the rhizome of calamus is that it's the thing that spreads the plant. So many of these plants here are calamus, but they're actually just one plant spreading, or a few plants spreading by rhizomes. So it is an underground structure that's going underneath the soil, and that underground structure called a the rhizome then puts out roots that anchor the plant and bring up nutrients, but the rhizome will keep spreading. And because the rhizome lives year after year while well, the above ground part dies, that's called a herbaceous perennial, so the above ground part dies, that the rhizome tends to have chemicals to discourage animals from eating them. And that's why I'm assuming, because uh, the rhizome of calamus is very strong with many different flavors and chemicals. So what I want to do is I want to dig up a rhizome and with the roots and then talk a little bit about how I use it medicinally. So a hori will do it, especially if you have a good hori with the, the, the saw on the side. And you just go underneath the rhizome and loosen it from the ground. You, can, you probably can't hear it, but I can hear the roots releasing it. The rhizome is not holding it in place, it's the roots and separate the roots from the soil. It's maybe the first time I've gathered one from my own land. And then I can cut it. I'm not gonna take a big piece off of this class. And instead of trying to saw it, I shall simply prune it. So here's the calamus with a little skull cap. Look at that. Scutellaria lateriflora. Fat chance it'll little chance it'll live, but I'm gonna put it in the soil anyway and cover it with dirt because I love skull cap as well. And so the part used, there's only a little bit section seen here, is see this white part right here. That's actually the main part I would use. And that white part, I didn't gather much here, but that's gonna extend for another couple of inches or longer, and another plant is gonna come off of it. So these are the roots down here. And often I just actually chop the roots off or cut them off for medicine and just use the rhizome. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of rhizome to show you, but enough for a class. So I'd probably cut it off from here. So here's our rhizome. Uh, often there's some green, often the rhizome will come to the surface of the soil, and when the rhizome comes to the surface, it does photosynthesize. So I just assume that that's fine too. So basically the rhizome will go below ground for a while, and then it's white, non-photosynthesizing, and then it'll come up to the surface, a new plant, and then you'll have some green photosynthetic material, um, and that's fine as well. And so actually, what I might do, I'm gonna use my knife, and always have a knife that does that. It's just, there's nothing more satisfying than clicking one's knife. Maybe some of you disagree with that and thinking of many things that are satisfying. And so here's a basic medicine of it. A little bit more difficult to try to do it in a movie form here, but then maybe I'll clear some of this extraneous material. And then if I was cutting it up for medicine, so this, this is very aromatic, and unfortunately, technology has not advanced where this is a, this is a microphone, but if this was a smellophone, the, or a nasophone, or ferminophone, and they put it there, and it wafted through your computers, which someday will happen, uh, you would either like it or not like it, but you would be hard to deny it. It is a strong smell. And then to make medicine, you just chop it into medium small pieces. I'm gonna put them on my knee here, and cut it like this, thickness. So you could also cut it this way and cut more pieces <laughs> and just make a big mess. So this is the calamus. I would put a piece in my mouth to show you uh, what happens to my face, but it would turn a little ugly. Basically, it's a really strong, it has a couple of flavors and I, well, actually, let me try to do this once. So I'm going to try to do this and still smile in front of the camera. This might, this, oh, delicious. Mmm, yum. Mmm, 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 mmm. Ah, uh, it's very strong tasting. I'm just practicing being able to put strong flavors in my mouth. Here's, I'm gonna see if I can spit and hit the Lenzo. Ooh, close. So, 
why do I do all this trouble for calamus? There's a couple of things that calamus does, but I want to speak about one of them that's really different than the other. And I, I would even gear it towards the word extraordinary. And that is that calamus helps some people focus. So I'm the teacher of a small herb school and my herb school, the Northeast School of Botanical Medicine is in the downstairs of my house on couches. Many of my students, all that's a little bit of a plug and many of my students are not conventional learners and don't, haven't gone to schools and don't sit still very well. And so, and just have a hard time focusing. I mean, everybody can have that. It doesn't matter whether you go to conventional schools or not. But I guess a lot of my students just have a, will have a hard time sitting, focusing on the couch while I talk on and on about things like calamus. Um, and try, but want to maintain focus. I mean, sometimes you just want to space out because who knows what I'm talking about. But sometimes it's just hard to maintain focus, maybe later in the day or something. And calamus, for whatever chemical reason, for some people will help increase their focus. So I, it's one of the few herbs that I always try to keep on the desk so that students can take it. I mean, it's a little bit of, they're telling you how they feel by taking it. But so while it does other stuff in the body, really it works on the nervous system. I don't know if it works in the you know, peripheral nervous system out here or the brain and spinal cord, probably, the central nervous system. But for many of the students, I find it excellent for over doodlers. So for those of those people who somehow doodle and doodle and doodle and doodle and they're all of a sudden they're lost and I can look and go, wow, that's an amazing drawing. What have I just talked about for a half hour? And it might be hard for them to recollect. So they, they, if they want to doodle, they can doodle. But if they want to learn and they're just having a hard time focusing, uh, then calamus is one of the plants I find really useful. I would say that it's a, you don't need a large amount of it. So there's some, there's a whole controversy with the chemical in this species, Acorus calamus, called beta acerone. I'm not gonna get into it now. Frankly, it's not my strongest suit, but in the amounts taken, it seems very safe for folks. So I feel pretty comfortable here. If they're taking large amounts over a long period of time, I would have to do a lot more research, but in general, most of the people I know who are even taking it for long periods don't take a lot at once. So, and there's also just questions if the beta acerone in calamus is problematic and if it gets converted to some more toxic chemicals. But this is stuff that some of you can do research on, beta acerone, acorus calamus, and find out more information. So, uh, the amount needed is often not very large. Like sometimes between 10 drops and 30 drops is plenty. Really, often what works best is 10 drops and then another 10 drops, and you just kind of keep giving that amount. Now, it's strong, and some people find the flavor fairly deplorable. So they're not gonna use calamus, so just strike those folks out. Um, but you can also put in a little bit of water to try to nullify it, but most of the time, the flavor is gonna come through. And so, uh, I would say, if focus is a problem of yours. Now, lots of things interrupt focus. So, I don't want to think that one plant is going to totally change somebody's behavioral habits. But if you just need a nudge towards focusing, I suggest just carrying calamus. You take five to 10 drops, 10 to 15 drops. So I just said five to 10, whatever the amount you need. It's usually a small amount. And it just, I don't know, it helps alertness a little bit. I've never tried it for people trying to drive and stay alert. There would be a lot trickier. But for a classroom situations, it's useful. So I just also want to point out that it's aromatic and bitter nature does make it what's called an aromatic bitter. So for people who have really stagnant digestive problems, if you eat food, it feels like it just stays there. You constantly feel bloated. Calamus is also an herb that you might want to consider. If you're, if you're the kind of person that has very fast metabolism and maybe very dry hard stools, it's a whole dialogue, but if you fast metabolism and dry heart stools, and maybe you don't sweat very much and are dry, this is not the herb for you. So this is an herb because that kind of person often doesn't need things that help break up stagnation because that's what calamus is doing. That aromatic bitter is good for, so stagnant, you might hold water longer, you might hold feces longer, but when you have a bowel movement, there's plenty in there. So that's another use of calamus. And there's other uses, but those are my two favorite for digestive stagnation and to help people focus. And I think that's it for calamus. So 
try to find a place where you can gather some ethically wild craft, meaning morally wild craft, meaning finding a place where it doesn't in, you don't interfere with the natural environment, and gather some rhizomes. Oh, I, I'm just preparations. So I, it's a plant that I do like fresh better, and I tincture it one to two, 95% ethanol, and that works great. Uh, I do dry some for tea, um, and it's just strong tasting, so I don't use it very much. Might be a little more aromatic. And though I said, I just said I use it fresh mainly, recently I started drying it, and I want to play with it dried. I've been at, having a tendency to want to fresh dry stuff. And so after, you know, the next time I talk about it, I might talk about how much I like it dry or don't like it dry. But mostly I've been tincturing it fresh, one to 295. So a calamus day to you.